Hello, and welcome to the Artificial Podcast with your host Nick Myers. Artificial intelligence, voice recognition, machine learning, robotic, actionable analytics. It is Nick's goal to help everyone understand the impact that emerging technologies are having on our lives both personally and within our organizations. Your glimpse into the growing world of emerging technology starts now. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. Nick Myers. All right. All right. All right, Brett. What's all right? Given the title of this episode, just get it out of your system. We're going to the moon! Just say it. Get it out of your system, because I don't want to hear it again. <laughs> to the moon. I don't. I mean, you're acting like this is in my system constantly, but I hate it probably just as much as you. You do? I don't care. I've never said to the moon. Oh, I thought when when our friends were into the Do whole you, GameStop thing, I that thought you were. My, I thought you were my friend. You know, I don't give a crap about this Bitcoin crap. I'm just saying. I thought when all the GameStop stuff was going on a couple months ago, a couple months ago being January now, but a couple months ago, I thought you were just like our our friend Adam and Lovegrove, and you were no with your diamond hands and all the meme crap. Oh, I forgot all about that. Oh, I think you latched onto that more than me. I, ever, I, completely, I completely forgot about diamond hands. <laughs> you just know how to push the buttons, don't you? Yep. Beep, boop, beep, beep, boop. Anyhow, just for the listeners, get it out of your system and say it with feeling. Mm. That's my cue. <coughs> to the moon! All right, we're done. We're not going to say that anymore in this episode, okay? Okay. I just, I, I think, and the thing is, this has nothing to do with cryptocurrency which we'll be getting into what I'm about to say. But I think it annoys me because I know people in the investment space and I know they know their shit like the back of their hand. And I think it annoys me to have seen over the last several months an influx of people, which everybody has a right to invest. Oh, here we go. But if everybody was actually investing because they knew what they were doing and for a purpose, I get it. I get it 100%. But this meme-driven, to-the-moon crap just irritates me. It irritates me, and I'm not on the hype train with it. I refuse to be. Wait, wait, so you're saying that Tyler down the street that's 22 years old that saw a meme about Bitcoin currency, and he started investing, and now he's telling you all about it, it annoys you? Yeah. Yep. Oh. Yep, it really does. And yeah. our goal with, yep. And our goal with this episode is we're not telling you how to how to buy Bitcoin. We're not telling you how to invest in Bitcoin. I just want to talk about cryptocurrency and NFTs in general because it's been on such a hype cycle over the last several months specifically. And we did an episode on blockchain. Was that back in 2020? That may have been back or in the early 2020. Blockchain? Blockchain was like 2019, wasn't it? It was either... No. I think... I, when I think of the word blockchain, I don't think of uh, dismay and misery in the year 2020. I think of a nice... Well, I'm, I'm saying before the pandemic, I, I think I had Alex Shaw on the show. Yes. And he's probably one of the, he's That's an right. expert I often defer to when it comes to You're blockchain. Right. Yeah. Alex Shaw was in January. It was our first episode in 2020. Yes. So we really dove into blockchain with Alex Shaw, but I thought we'd do a bit of a refresher and then we dive into the cryptocurrency and NFT part of it because I think what also irritates me is you look at somebody like Alec who has invested so much of their life into blockchain and the blockchain technology and how it applies. And then you have all these people rushing to buy crypto, most of which probably don't even understand blockchain, the underlying technology that makes this so unique to begin with and powers it. Yeah, it's like the wild, wild west of uh, invisible currency. Well, actually, and that's what uh, some of the articles I was reading, it's like, oh, it's like back in the 1800s. It really is. went out west to mine gold and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This stuff is... I guess you, quote unquote, can mine it. Well, okay, the key difference now is what you brought up earlier, where because of all the hype and all of the memes and the internet stuff, you have people who have probably been in it for a couple of weeks who are now trying to tell others about it, how to spend their money, and 
it, 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 it's scary, actually. Here's the difference these days. We have a, a piece of technology that's 20 years old that gives the people the ability to think that they're experts in a field when they're absolutely not these days. And that's a problem. When people have false level of confidence about a certain topic. Well, you what was that it's... Dunning-Kruger effect or whatever it's called? No, that's yeah. not it. You know, no, you know the exactly graph I'm no. talking about, but... I think you brought this up before, and I, I never can place the graph. I can't but, remember the freaking name of the graph. But you but, said there's a guy that you play video games with who all of a sudden is... You don't have to name names, but... There's people that I know that act like they're experts in this, and they do it full-time, but live with parents, and... They and they've only been live. doing it... What, don't actually like, make a living off of it. And they've only been doing it, what, like two months? You ever, ever since it became popular. Ah, uh, so two months. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, what, I More like several months at this point. But and well, truthfully... if, you, if you if you if you if you like, okay. So this this is this is how I live my life, and this might, might be completely wrong. But if you want to get into crypto and all that, you want to do it ten years ago, and you want to invest in like the Bitcoin ten years ago. If you're investing and doing stuff when it's hype, when people are going crazy about it, you're too late. You're that's too with late. Everything. That's with everything, though. Yeah, right? that, that, that's that, yeah. It's not just now. Uh, now, I, I will say, just because there's a lot of hype and the price has inflated by you know like two hundred percent the last year, that doesn't mean you still shouldn't buy some. Because the cool thing about Bitcoin, of course, is you oh, can buy fractions no. of it, right? Correct. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you can make a lot of money still, but I'm just saying, like the people that want to be millionaires, billionaires from this, you should have done it ten years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're not going to be a millionaire. If you bought Bitcoin in like 2010... 0.01% of people will be millionaires from this right if, now. If you bought Bitcoin in 2010, you're, pre, you're pretty set right now. And you want to know what's funny, and I, I've been thinking about this story a lot, so I think it was back in either 2014 or 2015, and I remember hearing about Silk Road. Remember Silk Road that... Um, yeah, uh, Silk Road was that website, right? It was uh, the dark web... Oh, kind of dark, dark web website where you could buy drugs and stuff and they would only yeah, accept Bitcoin as transactions. Silk Road. So I, I went to go check it out because I was curious. And as Dude, it was wait, you reading, checked out the dark web? I don't think it was on the dark web. I think you could go to Silk oh. Road on the regular internet. They only I've accepted never, uh, Bitcoin as transaction though. I've never been to the dark maybe, web. Maybe it wasn't Silk Road. Maybe it was a, a another website that was doing you could buy drugs but they only accepted Bitcoin. Either way, I was just curious about the whole Silk yeah. Road thing. Never okay. bought drugs on it, making that clear now. Anyhow, I remember looking at how much you could buy the stuff for, and they would only accept the transaction in Bitcoin. And up until that point, I had kind of heard about Bitcoin, but barely knew anything about it. So I, of course, pulled up an article on Bitcoin, read that it was a cryptocurrency. I went over to the conversion rate, and you could, at that point, you could buy one Bitcoin for around four or $500, which to me in college at that time, I'm like, well, that's a lot of money. Why would I ever do that? However, yeah, hindsight, is 20, hindsight is 2020. If I would have taken two grand and bought uh -huh. four Bitcoins and sold it at the $50,000 high, I'd have like two, three hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, <laughs> which is crazy to think about. But again, hindsight is twenty twenty, right? Now, if you were, you know, lucky enough to be one of the people who invested in it early in twenty ten, and you bought a couple hundred Bitcoin, yeah. you're a millionaire right now. Yeah, but hindsight is twenty twenty. There, there's people that wrote articles about the internet how it wasn't going to take off. So anyhow. Yeah. Well, that was way longer of an intro than I wanted to do. But if you can't already tell, this whole episode is going to be on cryptocurrency, and we're going to touch a bit on NFTs. Specifically, we're talking about this this week because there has been so much hype, and really just want to dive into what the heck is going on, and why yeah. there's so much hype all of a sudden. What's going on, man? And I really think it just fascinates me how much the price of Bitcoin has inflated over the last year specifically. And, you know, you, 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 you follow somebody like Brian Romley, who I interviewed last summer on Twitter, and he's always talked about how Bitcoin's going to go up and up. And of course it happened because Brian's just really good at predicting things, yeah. but it was really fascinating to watch it actually play out in real life. And then you have all the people come in from Reddit and screw everything up. So, <laughs> God, I'm really not on the side of the of the hype stuff <clears throat> at all. I'm really not. I just you don't like artificial uh, popularity. You just no. said something. No, I don't. 
and I've never been that way. And maybe I've missed out on a lot of opportunities, but I also tend to know that, especially when it comes to the stock market and investing in money, when something's being hyped, like you said, it's already too late. And if you make the wrong investment, you're going to lose a lot of money when the bubble bursts. Mm -hmm. And a lot you know, of people... The whole thing's like artificial and fake anyways, but... Now we're just kind of like... Well, and unfortunately, you have a lot of people who are always looking for ways to get rich quick, so they dump a lot of money into the stuff and wind up losing money. Don't be wrong. There's a couple. That one college student that lost yeah. like 20 grand. Probably more than a couple, but there's a handful of people who end up doing well, but a lot of people won't. And that's what's scary, and that's what I don't like. Anyhow, I oh, think in I order... Yeah. I think in I order to really people. understand cryptocurrency, like we mentioned, we really need to dive into... What is blockchain? Because the true innovation of cryptocurrency itself is blockchain. And it is blockchain technology. And it is the distributed blockchain ledger that a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin uses. The good news is coming into this because I was curious about it for several years now. I actually kind of know quite a bit about it. But, of course, I do not claim to be an expert, right? I did have to read up and refresh my knowledge on this a bit. but Yeah, which makes sense. Really, the most innovative part of this is blockchain. And that's what I hold on to. Yeah, the cryptocurrency, it's going to be valuable. Cryptocurrencies will definitely be valuable. will continue to be valuable. And we may ultimately wind up with an internet-based currency in the future. But it's all going to be powered by blockchain. So when you look at blockchain, right, what is it? Well, more than anything, it's a, it's a specific type of database. So as you know, Brett, working with databases in your daily life, a database is typically set up in a bunch of rows, right? Or a table, and you have rows and rows and rows of data in this massive server, right? Yes. Well, a blockchain, well, I guess you look at a blockchain database, and all of that data, instead of being stored in rows and in these tables and servers, all the data is stored in blocks, that are chained together chronologically to the block ahead of it, which is like pretty a chain fascinating. Of blocks? Yes, Brett. A oh, chain blockchain. of blocks. Hence, <laughs> blockchain. Good, Brett. Good, Brett. <laughs> <laughs> and each block of information, this is where it gets really cool. Each block of information is assigned a unique hash, it is called along with the hash of the block before it. So every new block that gets added to the blockchain has the unique hash of the block before it, which is really fascinating. And it also includes a timestamp as to when the block was entered into the blockchain. Well, so you know. it's like a permanent entry that cannot be altered, which I think is just the coolest part of all this. And these hash codes that is assigned to each block are created by very, very dense mathematical functions that turn digital information into a series of random numbers and letters. And if that information is changed in any way, the hash changes as well. So keep in mind, because on a distributed blockchain network like Bitcoin, if any one of those blocks is changed, the hash changes, and then all the computers in the system know that it changed, pretty much building a 100% foolproof system. It's really cool. Jesus, it's really, like, really cool. It sounds like they're creating like DNA helixes. Sure, I guess. <laughs> and if it's altered, you change the whole thing entirely. Maybe not, but that's a that could be a way of looking at it. That's um, all I'm I'm picturing in my head. I'm thinking of that Jurassic Park, you know, like uh, the frog DNA. Oh. <laughs> you just look at me like, what the hell is he talking about? Just. Just go back to listening here for a bit, Brett. Sounds good. So what I just described with these mathematical functions that transform digital information into these hashes for different block entries in the blockchain, that's essentially what Bitcoin mining is. So you hear people mining Bitcoin. They're essentially providing the computer power that mathematically assigns these hashes to the different blockchain ledger entries. And it, of course, takes a lot of computing power to do this because the math is so complex. Why are you yeah. still smiling? Because I'm just laughing <laughs> the silence after I said that. So it. that's what Probably that's what funny. that's what Bitcoin mining is. Whenever you anyways, term. yeah, okay, I get it. So Bitcoin like, mining. there's they they just make a bunch of uh, blocks in a database that chain together and they're uh, well, all identified by hashes. A completely distributed database, so it's not within one server, right? It exists on all of the different computers or nodes that are within the blockchain, yeah. and blockchains can be both private and public. 
but the Bitcoin blockchain, of course, is a public one that is decentralized and all users collectively retain control, which is very unique because there are little things in this world where everybody has control over it, right? And sure. decentralized blockchains like the Bitcoin one are immutable, which means that the data entered is irreversible, which again is an incredibly valuable part of a blockchain. Can you erase the data? No. You can't because erase it's distributed. it. It exists on all of the computers that are a part of the blockchain. So once it's out there, it's out there forever. Yes. Yep. So it's like it's, the internet. Sure, I guess, even though you can have private servers and, and different yeah. things like that. But because of the way blockchain is designed, especially in a decentralized nature, the same exact blockchain ledger exists on every single computer. <clears throat> so there is always a check and balance, which is really neat. And essentially, decentralized blockchains are unable to be hacked in theory, because if a hacker were to try and change the hash or change the information of one block, another computer or another node is going to pick up on that, and it has to be verified. And if all the com more than 51% of the nodes within the blockchain system don't agree, it doesn't get changed, which Jeez. makes a majority of the power in the hand. Well, it places the power in the hands of the majority instead of the hands of the few, which is, again, very unique. Um. So, but these different nodes of computers that anybody can set up essentially process and verify each transaction within the Bitcoin blockchain network. And how does this exactly work? Well, there's this really good chart that I won't show, but that I will walk yeah. through because I think the transaction part is really neat. You, so, just explain, you, just, you just explained all that. And I have no idea what's going on. So, for example, Brett, <laughs> imagine you have a Bitcoin and you buy something with it. Well, the moment you buy something with that Bitcoin, a new transaction is entered. And then the transaction is then transmitted to the network of nodes on this peer-to-peer -peer network. And it's, you know, these nodes are scattered all over the world. Now, this network of computers then solves various different mathematical equations to confirm the, the validity of the transaction. And once confirmed to be legitimate transactions, they are clustered together into blocks. And then these blocks are then chained together, creating a long history of all transactions that are permanent, and the transaction is complete. This takes place in about 10 to 15 minutes, which is far quicker than performing any transaction with a bank today. I'm just going to accept that you said that. What? I don't know. what. I didn't comprehend any of it. How do you, what, 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 what's the holdup? I don't know. I didn't retain any of the information you just said. <laughs> That's great. That's great. If you're listening, please don't be listening or watching. Please don't be like Brett. No, if you're so, listening, if you're listening, please rewind that and listen again so you retain the information. <laughs> if you also go into Investopedia and look up blockchain, you can find the chart. It's not that complicated. But okay. I just thought I'd do a brief explanation. So like I said earlier, in order to change any of the information stored you know, within that blockchain ledger, more than 51% of the network would need to agree, which means that whatever changes do occur are in the best interest of the majority, which is, again, one of the incredibly unique parts of blockchain. And in a decentralized blockchain ledger, each transaction is publicly recorded. So you, me, anyone can see the movement of a cryptocurrency like Bitcoin in real time. And each Bitcoin is always tracked, right? So each coin has a publicly viewable history making theft incredibly difficult, if not entirely impossible. Wow. So unlike now, where a robber can go to a bank and steal a bunch of dollar bills, you can't track where the stolen money is, right? But if somebody were to, say, steal Bitcoin, you would know where every single Bitcoin is. So it's almost yeah. impossible to steal them. Yeah, how do you steal something that doesn't exist, really? You know. Well, it's, it's, it, it's not even so much that it's digital. It's just the fact that because of the blockchain ledger, yeah. every single Bitcoin is tracked. Yep. So, which honestly makes it incredibly secure, incredibly yep. transparent, which does not exist within our current system of money and banking I mean, whatsoever. Obviously, this is going to be the currency of the future. So, or or some variation of it, you know. Well, that's why there's thousands and thousands of coins these days, is because they're fighting to be the one to be used in like 50 years. Yes, which leads me to Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dojo, my. Do what? Oh, you, that's what you said, the uh, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Doge. Oh, my. Like lions and tigers and bears from Wizard of Oz. Is that, is that the joke? Yes, Brett. Oh. I just want to clarify in case people didn't understand. Oh, you've, you've been clarified, you <laughs> freaking knob. Anyhow. Hey. 
officially to what you just said with how many yeah. different types of cryptocurrency are out there, there's actually 10,000 different types of cryptocurrencies available today because anybody 10, can make thousand? one. Yes, anybody yeah, can make yeah, one. Yeah, exactly. You can just make one. Like Doge. Right. Doge. Doge was a meme, a joke, and then it became popular. Thank you, Elon Musk. Anyhow, I won't get on that tangent yet. But yeah, there are about 10,000 different types of cryptocurrencies, and they generally fall into two categories. So you have coins, which include Bitcoin and all the other altcoins out there, and then you have tokens, which are essentially NFTs. Well, they're not essentially NFTs, but the main principle of an NFT uses tokens on a blockchain network, right? Sure. So when you hear altcoin, because there's Bitcoin and altcoins, an altcoin actually means alternative to Bitcoin. So whenever you hear the term altcoin, it just means a cryptocurrency that isn't Bitcoin. <laughs> that's like a subdomain to love. Sure. I just think it's pretty funny that that's, that's what that means. It's actually just an alternative to Bitcoin. And okay. What? You seem confused. Aren't they all alternatives to Bitcoin? Well, yeah, and that's why they're called altcoins. What? Like every single coin in existence is an alternative to Bitcoin? Correct. Oh, okay. So Bitcoin is Bitcoin is like, you know, the mast on the ship, right? Yeah, because they're like the first ones. It's the OG this. cryptocurrency. Yeah. And like Bitcoin, most cryptocurrencies have a limited supply of coins, which more or less they need to do this to keep the balance in check and to reinforce, and this is very important, it's perceived value, right? Because... Uh -huh. If you had an unlimited amount of something, the value goes down because anybody can have it. But if you constrain the amount that's available, it gets value because there's only so much to go around. Yep, like any... Simple concern. economics. Yeah. And there is a fixed number of Bitcoins that can exist. 21 million, actually, as decided by the creator or creators of Bitcoin, which nobody still really knows who created Bitcoin. And the only way to create more Bitcoin is for the protocol to allow it. So unless the protocol that Bitcoin is built on allows more to be created, you're never getting more than 21 million. Oh, okay. So it's so not only, like the, only 21 million coins can be generated. It's not like the dollar or other current world government currencies where the government could just be like, "Ooh, we're going to wave our hands and make more." Wait, so the federal the Federal Reserve, quote unquote, the Federal Reserve of like uh, digital currency is an AI. I don't even know if it's an AI. It's just whatever the protocol yeah, well, like, is. Oh, uh, yeah. Is it it, it is not AI. It's just here you go. It's 20 million. <laughs> right. It's whatever the developers of Bitcoin <laughs> yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. So. It'd be cool if it wasn't AI, though, and it just delegated, like, the currency out to people. Could <laughs> be in the future. But, yeah, Maybe. unlike unlike the dollar that can be created out of thin air because it's essentially fake, which yeah. Bitcoin is too. Well, every, fake, every, but... everything's fake. That's what I say. Like, every, you, 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 okay, so. You get rid of Bitcoin, what do you have, right? Let, let's 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 do this. I like doing this. You get rid of Bitcoin, what do you have for currency? The dollar. Yeah, you get rid of the dollar, what do you have for currency? Say you say you get rid of all currency, like all the dollar, all paper, what do you have for currency? Well, you have a store of value asset like gold or silver. Okay, get get rid of gold and silver. Then what do you have? Well, you trade like we used to do thousands of years ago. Like eggs, milk, cheese, well, resources. Whatever, whatever. Resources, resources, right? Get rid of every single resource on the planet. What do you have to trade? Hugs. No, land. <laughs> oh, yeah, land. Yep. And that's the basic. You all oh, yeah, down to land. And who owns the land? The rich people. Yeah, essentially, yes, yeah, the government. <laughs> well, that's why land was so important back then, because once you owned a piece of land... You were the owner of that land, and you can't create any more land. Like, literally, so no is, more land can be created. My, yeah, so my point is, no matter what you do in life, and no matter what you receive in life, and what you gather in your life, you will never have power, because you can never own land. Rich is why owning land is actually incredibly important. So if you can manage to find land and hold on to it, yep. that's not a half-bad idea. Exactly. So. Anyways. But, but really... Okay, now this goes into the whole private property thing, because when you think about it, so the federal government of the United States, other than the Native American reservations that they so graciously gave to the people we took the land from, in the United States, the federal government technically owns all the land, they just allowed people to buy it from them. Mm -hmm. Like, there really is no true private property yeah. 
in the United States because if, like, the no, federal no, government owned all the correct, land at one point. Correct. No matter where you live, the government can always come in and say, hey, we own this. Get the hell out of here. Right. So you never really have true power in life no matter what you have. Well, right. And I mean, there's the whole sovereign state thing and all that crazy bullshit. But at the end of the day, that's why people in medieval times and pe ancient humans, you know, there was only a certain chunk of people that were the most wealthy because they owned all the land. And if you own the land, you own the resources. Correct. So, and if you own the resources, you can own the gold, the silver. You own the gold, the silver. You can make the fiat currency. If you have correct. the fiat currency now, you can have the digital currency. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe not that, but... I don't know. Well, because cryptocurrency is outside of the realm of... No, you know what I'm saying, though. Like, you need money to buy the digital currency. Well, yeah. You need, you, need, you, need, you need a fiat I'm currency. About I'm talking about, yeah, I'm talking about investing into it. Well, actually, no, that's not entirely true. Because with Bitcoin, oh, you know? if you mine Bitcoin, like you're a part oh, of that yeah, network, you can, yeah. you can actually earn it Correct. from the intelligence that you put into authenticating guess, the transactions. And I guess that's where the wild, wild west analogy comes into play. You can just mine right. it and gain currency. It's like gold mining. Yes. So, oh, that was a good tangent. I like that one. Um, mm -hmm. But, yeah, there's only a limited amount of Bitcoin in circulation currently. Now... Bitcoin was the first true cryptocurrency, if you want to look at it that way, and it was actually released to the public in 2009. And the Bitcoin protocol is built, of course, on a blockchain that was first published in a white paper, actually, by Bitcoin pseudo-anonymous creator Satoshi Nakamoto, which could be one person, could be a group of people. Everyone was convinced they found the guy uh, you know, several years ago, but he was very adamant that he was not Satoshi Nakamoto or the group of people or one person who created Bitcoin. So nobody really knows who created Bitcoin, which I think is still yeah. really fascinating. It is fascinating. And honestly, that speaks to the distributed nature of it and the decentralized nature of it, because imagine if everybody knew who the one person was, that person would have control. But because nobody knows... It fits very much into that decentralized model of the currency, which I think is super cool. <clears throat> mm -hmm. So outside of Bitcoin, of course, you have altcoins like Ethereum, Ripple, Omni, NXT, Waves, and Counterparty, which are some of the most common altcoins. But they have also created their own set of separate systems and protocols, much different than Bitcoin, of course, which is why they're called altcoins. Now, when we look at cryptocurrency, there is no inherent value because it's all based on consumer confidence and simply supply and demand. That's it. There's no one backing it. It's all based on supply and demand and the people who buy it, confidence in it. Yeah. Of course, unlike the U.S. dollar or any type of government-based currency, which is backed by the U.S. federal government and the Federal Reserve, cryptocurrencies have no official backing. So, I mean, they're really... I mean, you can yeah. buy things with Bitcoin, but because... Of how expensive it is, right? It's. I never again, really thought of buy. You don't buy things with the digital currency. Not, well, you, you can. Trade, you, it's an easy way to convert your dollar into Bitcoin, and then convert Bitcoin into like a European dollar, or not. You know what I'm saying? Like it's an easy way to convert currency. Well, it's 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 not exactly. It's it's more or less becoming a digital store of value asset, which we'll get into in a bit, and. Uh, Again, it's it's one of those things where there's a lot of distrust right now in world government and there's a lot of concern about stock market manipulation <clears throat> and the volatility, well, not even the volatility, but just the fiat nature of the U.S. dollar. I mean, there's there's so much to why people are all of a sudden really focused on buying crypto. Yeah. And those are those are a few of the of the main reasons. But really, when you look at cryptocurrency right now, it also truly reaffirms how fake money is. And nothing really has well, value yeah. unless we say it does. Correct. Yep. Literally, <laughs> look at diamonds. Like, Which we've talked about. They're just shiny rocks. If you and I built our own community and we all of a sudden said, okay, this water glass is now the currency. Produce more water glasses and that's what you're going to use. One water glass is worth this much in a resource or like that, of value. What movie is it? It's where, I forgot what movie it was, but it was like, hey, sell this pen. And he goes to sell the pen. Oh, was and that a... He gives him a piece of paper. He's like, hey, can you write something on this napkin for me? Is that Wolf of Wall Street? I Maybe it was, yeah. He's like, can, can you write something on this napkin for me? He's like, I can't. I don't have a pen. He's like, how much do you want the pen now for? <laughs> like, you know, if you give a reason to have it and restrict 
you know, people of having that thing. Yes. But give them a reason to use it, and then you just jack up the price. Supply and demand. Yeah. The, the most basic economic tenet that drives everything. Whether we think it does or not, it does. Yeah. And that's also... Have you ever researched diamonds and how, like... The, They're only worth something because we say they are? Well, it, it, they weren't <laughs> even popular. Like, diamonds... People didn't give a crap about diamonds back in, like, the 1800s. Like, they've only... The popularity of them... Well, became that's about... not entirely true because De Beers, which is the largest producer of diamonds in the world, they marketed it so well that they were able to make it such... They were able to position it as a high store of value. I can't remember the exact year it became popular, but I know that it was in the diamonds, late eighteen hundreds. Diamonds weren't worth like anything in most of human history, and then diamond companies wanted to sell diamonds, so they made Correct. it popular and they commercialized yes. it. And they did it very well. I actually yes. just watched uh, <laughs> one of the explained episodes on Netflix about diamonds and how De Beers did that and still does that today when they want to penetrate a new market. They're very yeah. good at marketing. But yeah, and now everyone wants one to get married and all that crap, you know, like it's like a necessity to get married. You need a diamond ring. Yes. Maybe you watched the same thing I did because it sounds exactly what they talked about. Yeah. Um, Anyways. Anyhow, it just shows how fake money really is and nothing really has any value unless we say it does. And cryptocurrency, of course, as we talked about briefly, is created by mining. No, so miners usually don't pay directly for their crypto, which is a unique part of it. They earn it with their smarts. So you don't have to buy into crypto. You can easily buy a mining rig and set it up to mine, and you could earn cryptocurrency. It's a lot harder to do now than it was early on, but you can still do it. Yeah. Just because I think the 21, of course, you can't produce any more Bitcoin right now. You, it's capped at 21 Have you seen million. those server farms? Oh, yeah. They're, they're ridiculous. They're like they're yeah, like yeah. barns. They're like... So, they're like a, a um, what do you call it? Storage units. Those are like the serious, farm. like those are the serious folks, though, and they tend to make a lot of money doing it. Anybody can do it. Like you or I can yeah. transform one of our computers into a miner. I'm just saying that, that's where all, all that's where all of our GPUs are going. You know what I'm saying? Yes, yes, because it takes so much computing power. But that's also one of the concerns too, right? Because it consumes so much energy that it actually is in a way contributing negatively to climate change because it's using so much power. How stupid is that? I thought about that the other day. It's like, <laughs> we're mining this invisible currency that's ruining our planet. Like, how freaking dumb is this? <laughs> yeah, like, but I can, we're I, I, I can understand, a lot of other ways, too. I can understand, like, destroying trees in the Amazon because that makes paper, and paper, like, you know, we need paper. But, but do we digital, need paper? A, not really. <laughs> not really anymore, to be honest. Yeah, you're, you're right. But now, digital currency, it's like, in the hopes that this is going to be the thing that we're going to use in the future to, like, you know, trade. Maybe, yeah. like, what if this just flops? What if we never use digital currency in the well, future? Then what we if just a, a lot of, at least a lot of time and energy and money on it. I don't think that'll be the case <laughs> no, at, I, at all. No, it's, but, it's, it's possible, but I don't think it's the case. Yeah. So, yeah, but if you mine it, you can earn it. And the value is built in because the supply is limited, right? Back to supply and demand. So it's just up to the complex computers to dig it up dig it up by cracking codes and solving complicated puzzles, which a lot of it is guesswork. But once the computers solve it and it's on the block of the blockchain is solved, the other miners drop what they're doing and go to the next block. So they're cost these computers and, and the ledger are trying to constantly enter new blocks into the system. And it's done mathematically to what I've been alluding to this whole time. So yeah, it's basically everybody's competing. So all these different nodes of computers are competing against one another to solve the equation first. Yes. That's essentially what's happening. So I think another very interesting part of this is, you know, you look at cryptocurrency versus banks, right? And, uh -huh. I mean, there's, there's a lot of stark differences. So I'm going to go through this again, this really cool chart that I found. I won't share it, but I'll just walk through it. So when we look at banks, right? Banks have been around for, uh, truthfully, probably thousands of years at this point. You know, um, yeah. Our modern system of banking has only existed since like sixteen, seventeen hundreds. But like, people banks need themselves, to, people need a place to put their gold. Yes, yeah. banks themselves have existed for thousands of years. Anyway, um, but we look at a typical bank, right? So mm -hmm. our hours of operation. Well, a typical brick and mortar bank are open from nine a.m. to five on weekdays only. Sometimes Saturdays, never Sunday. With Bitcoin or crypto. 
There are no sit hours. It's open 24-7, 365 days a year. Yes. <laughs> then you look at transaction fees. So <clears throat> card payments. So, of course, those fees vary based on the card and are not paid by the user, but they're passed on to the... Um, they're passed on to the retailer or they're passed on to the business that yeah. allows you to pay with a card, which mm -hmm. oftentimes can cause the price of goods and services to go up because the business has to make up for that card transaction fee. Um, you know, when you deposit checks, checks can cost between $1 to $30, depending on your bank. Same with ACH transfers. Wire transfers are expensive. It's all checks? hell. What? Who buys checks? There's still a lot of people that use checks. Yeah, now, we look 60. at transaction fees for Bitcoin or crypto. So I guess specifically Bitcoin, it has a variable transaction fee, which is determined by the miners and the users. So this fee can range between zero and $50. But users have the ability to determine how much of a fee they are willing to pay, which is really unique. Uh, my favorite one, transaction speed. So a credit or debit card usually takes 24 to 48 hours to clear the bank. Checks usually take 24 to 72 hours ACH 24 to 48, wire within 24 hours. And heading out takes typically, you know, a, a, a kind of long period of time to, you know. Where do you store your Bitcoins, though? Like a bank? Process. Well, you store it in a digital wallet, which can either Is be it... on the internet or you can have it in cold storage on a hard drive. That's so sketchy. That's like saying I'm going to hide my money in my walls. Kind of. Anyhow, so it takes a bank a long time to process and approve transactions. Bitcoin transactions can take as little as 15 minutes, which is really neat. Um, privacy, of course, because Bitcoin can be as private as the user wishes. All Bitcoin is traceable, but it's impossible to establish who has ownership of Bitcoin versus your bank account information that is stored on a bank's private server that is liable to be subpoenaed by the government at any time. True. I, I don't know, Nick. I just I feel I, maybe maybe it's just because this is all brand new, but I still I still feel more safe with banks. I mean, and that's that's an opinion you can have. I'm on the side of I think if we move <laughs> to an, a, you know an incredibly legit cryptocurrency that we can use just like the dollar and yeah. we set up this type of blockchain system, that's game changing. Like if we, if we, once we get to that point where like all of a sudden my currency doesn't like like if, imagine if my, if my currency is sitting in a hard drive and Elon Musk can tweet about it and it just my currency means nothing anymore I don't trust it. But that's the same thing with the dollar though too, right? You can have dollars and all of yeah. a sudden if something happens with the government or anything, I well, mean the same. Yeah, thing. what's more likely? Right now, I mean the likelihood of anything happening to the U.S. dollar is low, but you get my point. Okay. But what I'm looking at is like peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So like right now when I want to send you money, I have to go through a third party. I have to use my bank. I have to use Venmo. And, and even then you have to send it. So say, for example, we use Venmo, right? I send you money. It goes into Venmo. Mm -hmm. Then you can transfer it to your bank, which takes 24 to 48 hours to do. <clears throat> if yes. we had a fully functioning digital currency system built on a blockchain protocol, I could send you money directly to you in 10 to 15 minutes, maybe even instantly if it's advanced enough. And my worth goes up like that. What do you mean? You said it takes how, how long to my bank, right? Well, 24 to 48 hours. Typically it takes 24 to 48 hours for my worth to go up, where if you send me Bitcoin currency and digital currency, my worth just goes up like that because it goes right into my bank. Well, my quote unquote bank, hard drive, whatever you want to call it. Well, and in, in, in the cryptocurrency future, I'd imagine we would have yeah. some type of everybody have a crypto wallet or, or something like that. I don't I'm know. I'm sure like, you know, how, like all these stores have like gone online and like, yeah, all these banks will go online, which I'm, they're online right now. But you know what I'm saying? Like they have to go into the digital realm. I'm sure we'd see like a Chase or a Summit Credit Union, like we trade Bitcoin now or like we hold your Bitcoin for you or something, something like that. I Hopefully know. it's not a bank. Hopefully it's more decentralized. But <laughs> yeah, you know, who knows? Okay. These these banks want to keep their power, so they're going to do any, everything in their power to like hold on to it. So they're probably going to start going into the Bitcoin world in the future. I bet you're going to see like yeah. Chase and banks and associated. You know, oh, a lot of are, a lot of the major banks are a lot of the major banks already working on blockchain. They're private okay. blockchains, right. but they're working on on blockchain and implementing that. So. I think really, you know, we're talking about cryptocurrency, but one of the areas I really think blockchain can benefit is with elections, right? Of course, in the United States now with this whole big discussion on all of the fraud that apparently is happening, that isn't happening, 
you know, there's a lot of discussion on how can we make elections more secure. Well, imagine if we use blockchain for our elections. Shouldn't be a question. Where you had a decentralized ledger that counted everybody's votes automatically. For example, you or I have an app on our phone or we get assigned a unique crypto coin or unique token. And then when we place our vote, that vote is validated by the decentralized blockchain. So there's a public record. It can't be altered. And say the candidate has a wallet that those individual tokens or coins go into. There is no way, pardon my language, to fuck with that. And that would create the most secure form of elections in the history of humanity. It's going to be called vote chain. I'm betting. Trademark that right now, Brett. So somebody can buy that domain right now. <laughs> vote chain. But right? Like with all this bitching about election security, this makes sense and can be easily <clears throat> implementable. Like... Everybody could do it digitally, so everybody could vote. Oh, dude, you know people are going to be, be bitching about it. Like, <laughs> digitally on my phone, it's so unreliable. I'm going to get hacked. But it isn't, because if I you're operating it. on a blockchain I, I network, it, it is the most secure and transparent way to conduct secure. elections. I know it's secure. I know it isn't. Because you know where every vote, you know where people. every vote is. You know where every vote I is. I understand that. I'm just uh, like, the average American, Nick, do you think they're going to trust that shit? Well, imagine this, too. If we ever implemented a voting system like that, then we damn well know Republicans are never going to get elected again because everybody will be able to vote. Yeah. So that's not going to happen. And they don't want that. Yeah. Again, not to go political, but we well, know. You it's, know. It's fact. Yeah, you know. It's just factual. Like, there's no... That's not an opinion. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know. So as we wrap things up here, I don't think we're actually going to get to NFTs. So we may have to do a separate episode on that. Um, okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll just end it on. Yeah, so yeah, we have to wrap it up. Well, I just, I'm a bit on a time schedule with this yeah, episode, okay, but okay. anyhow, I think, I think we'll end on why is there so much demand all of a sudden for crypto, especially Bitcoin? Well, the number one reason is inflation because there's been a lot of that the federal government and the federal reserve, I mean, the inflation rate is increasing. They don't like to say that we're experiencing inflation because it's very bad politically. But I think we all can agree right now with the supply chain issues we're having and supply and demand issues. There is inflation going on right now. And because of recent inflation and lowering purchase, lowering purchasing power, and as much as these stimulus packages were needed over the last year because of COVID, they dumped a lot of money into the system out of thin air. A lot of money. In fact, 35%, 35%. Right, 35% of all of the dollars that have been that are in circulation right now were created in the last year, which is huge. And because of that, it is leading to some inflation. And because of all that money, spending is driving people to, to store of value assets like gold and silver and apparently Bitcoin. Because, again, oh, really? there's a limited supply of it, so it holds more value. Whereas, again, the government can wave its hands and make more money. Mm -hmm. Which we've talked about. Which I've never understood. <laughs> but they can do that. Yeah, they just... And yeah. On top of that, Bitcoin's mining reward halving mechanism further proves its scarcity. Because the supply is so limited. And merit as a store of value asset. Because, again, typically a store of value asset is something that isn't unlimited. Fiat currency is technically unlimited. Bitcoin has a cap on it. Same with gold, same with silver, diamonds, you know, any store of value asset cannot, there's a limited supply of it. So people are also dumping into there because, you know, it can't totally crash like the dollar can because it's all fake. Um, and institutional adoption as both an investment and as a service is causing strong confidence because you see... Banks starting to buy cryptocurrency. Of course, you had Elon Musk at one point saying Tesla was going to accept Bitcoin, which gave it a lot of validity as a potential currency. Of course, he backtracked he just, on yeah, that. Backtracked but even that. so, it was it still showed that at some point it is going to be accepted as a form of currency and a form of trade, which increases yeah. the confidence of it quite a bit. And pulling all of that together, the infrastructure of Bitcoin is immensely stable at this point and has matured greatly. Uh, and because the blockchain ledger that it's on has been around for, you know, more than 10 years at this point, it's very stable. And that also 
gives it more confidence, which is why people are dumping money into it. The underlying technology. So yeah, we're not going to touch on NFTs. We'll do that in a different episode because I really want to talk about those and why. And it relates to this discussion, but yeah. Um, okay. So we'll we'll just leave NFTs in the in the title and we'll say, oh, we're going to come back with that. Sounds good. Anyhow, I like that. That was good. Yep. I'm just fascinated by all of it. Again, I'm not trying to give advice and telling you how to spend your money like a lot of people are right now, but I just wanted to paint the picture and it's it the whole thing is so much more than just Bitcoin. It is truly the underlying technology of blockchain and that's what I was really trying to get across. It just this. it it fascinates me that <clears throat> people can use their imaginations and just come up with things that control the world out of thin air. Very smart people. Yep. Probably cryptographers came up with this whole thing. Going to be real. No, I have no idea. Actually, no. Not probably. More than likely, it was cryptographers who did this. We'll never know the exact people, but... But, you know, you know I mean? Like, this shapes people's lives. Event that pretty much right. shapes people's lives, how people act in the world, how the world works, and we just came up with it like we're playing Legos. Essentially, yes. Using our little imaginations. So, anyhow... Well, I, I just realized I left the Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dojo Mai thing up there for too long. Oh, well. Oh, well. <laughs> Anyhow, thank you once again for joining us on this week's episode of the Artificial Podcast. Whether you're a listener, whether you're watching, thank you. Thank you, as always, for tuning in, however you choose to do so. And make sure, if you haven't already, you subscribe on Apple Podcasts, wherever you listen to podcasts. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube by smashing that subscribe button right right down below there. Hit the Somewhere. bell for notifications. And if it, if it was gonna be on YouTube, it'd probably be like right here. Sure. You know more about that than I do. D wow. If you really enjoy what you hear, please consider becoming a Patreon subscriber to the Artificial Podcast. Check out our Patreon page. We have a couple of different membership tiers so you can show your support for the show and help us produce even more content, better content, get some additional perks because of it, you know. Uh, you can also join our Discord community by heading over to our website so you can hop into the discussions that we tend to have after these episodes. We post all of our episodes to Discord, or at least trying to now. I just so, realized you have a capital N I in your your name this whole time. Oh, did you look at that? <laughs> Anyhow, <laughs> follow the Artificial Podcast on Facebook and Twitter at the Artificial Piece. So you can keep up to date with everything happening, and of course, if you'd like to listen to all of our episodes, both past and present. Visit our website, open up the Artificial Podcast Vault by heading to <clears throat> www.theartificialpodcast.com. Anything else you'd like to add, Brett? Join our Discord. All right. Join our Discord. Just Google the Artificial Podcast Discord or something. I'm sure you can probably find it somewhere. Or do are we linking that in our social media? I told uh, our digital marketing manager to start including all that. All right. That works then. So anyhow. Thank you all. Have a great week, and we'll be back soon. All right, see you later. Artificial intelligence. Voice recognition. Machine learning. Robot. You've been listening to the Artificial Podcast with your host, Nick Myers. Nick Myers. To stay up to date with all of our latest episodes, you can subscribe on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and Google Podcasts. Or you can visit us on the web at www.theartificialpodcast.com. Until next time, 